Good morning, and welcome to our city hearing on defense in a digital era, artificial intelligence, information technology, and securing the Department of Defense. Just a reminder of our three uh, holy commandments on the city subcommittee. One is that we shall start on time, check. Uh, two, uh, five minutes, we will enforce the five minutes. I understand that you may not have the shot clock there, so we'll give you a little bit of grace, and we'll try and, you got phones, so you can time yourself. Um, and please try not to use uh, obscure acronyms and jargon. We want to communicate in simple and direct language that normal human beings in America can understand. Um, we are uh, pleased to be joined today by the department's chief information officer, Mr. John Sherman, and the inaugural chief digital and artificial intelligence officer, Dr. Craig Martell. I welcome both of you, and especially uh, Dr. Martell, in your first appearance with the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, you both have very important jobs, and our job is to ensure that you do your jobs well. Uh, to underscore the stakes of your job and our job, uh, I would like to quote a recent report from our friends at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE. Uh, quote, research reveals that China has built the foundations to position itself as the world's leading science and technology superpower by establishing a sometimes stunning lead in high-impact research across the majority of critical and emerging technology domains, including artificial intelligence and key quantum technology areas. In the long term, China's leading research position means that it has set itself up to excel not just in current technological development in almost all sectors, but in future technologies that don't yet exist. Unchecked, this could shift not just technological development and control, but global power and influence to an authoritarian state where the development, testing, and application of emerging critical and military technologies isn't open and transparent, and where it can't be scrutinized by independent civil society and media. In the, in the more immediate term, that lead could allow China to gain a stranglehold on the global supply of certain critical technologies. Such risks are exacerbated because of the willingness of the CCP to use coercive techniques outside of the global rules-based order to punish governments and businesses, including withholding the supply of critical technologies." Unquote. Gentlemen, I'm concerned uh, that we are losing in key areas of the strategic competition with the CCP. I would prefer that we win. As we say in Green Bay, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. So today, I look forward to hearing from you how we can fight smarter and win this competition. And with that, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Connor. Thank you, uh, Chairman Gallagher. And I uh, appreciate uh, your leadership on this uh, committee and your bipartisan spirit uh, in which you've conducted uh, the hearings. I would also like to welcome Mr. John Sherman, the DOD Chief Information Officer, and Dr. Craig Martell, the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer. Thank you for your service and thank you for appearing before the subcommittee. On the heels of the one-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine, one constant theme that we have seen is ways that the war has been transformed and different from the past. From the ubiquitous presence of tactical unarmed, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, to the use of digital platforms, it's obvious that the continued integration of advanced technologies in combat is an essential component of modern warfare. And that is why the DOD's CIO and Chief Digital Intelligence and Artificial Intelligence Officer's appearance is so important. One of the uh, things we need to focus on in the second year of the creation of the Chief Digital uh, and Artificial AI, Artificial Intelligence Officer, is the challenges that you have encountered and ways that we can offer assistance. Uh, Deconflicting some of the duties uh, is important. Uh, one of the other pretty important uh, issues is the recruitment uh, of talent and the retention of talent uh, and how we do a, a, a good job in, in recruiting the top talent. I know we uh, have an uh, advantage of doing that in the private sector in Silicon Valley, but we need our best and brightest uh, in technology coming into government. And I want to get your thoughts on uh, additional steps that we can do uh, for recruitment. Furthermore, the growing importance of the electromagnetic spectrum and the highly visible role of the department's spectrum usage uh, is something that uh, uh, I hope this committee can discuss. Uh, finally, I want, would like to hear your work about securing our networks and that of the defense uh, industrial base. Uh, that is uh, absolutely uh, critical uh, in any uh, modern warfare. 
Thank you again uh, for your, both of your uh, appearance before this committee. Thank you. Mr. Sherman is recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Khanna, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Now, last summer, I also held the position of acting chief digital and artificial intelligence officer, artificial intelligence officer. But as you note, sir, sitting next to me is Dr. Craig Martell, who is now the permanent CDAO. We're privileged to have him on the DOD team, and we work together on many key priorities that we're going to discuss today. All of our modernization initiatives are focused on ensuring the joint force is prepared to win against peer and near peer competitors. This means identifying and leveraging effective technologies and approaches to stay ahead of our pacing challenge of the People's Republic of China, as well as any other nation or group that might seek to do us or our allies harm. Succeeding in this space is why my team and I come to work every single day, and it is our overriding mission imperative. We also continue to take take in lessons on how the digital landscape is constantly evolving from the battlefields of Ukraine and elsewhere, and we endeavor constantly to strengthen our interoperability with allies and partners around the globe. Driven by these priorities, we have made key strides in digital modernization since I last testified before this subcommittee last year. In December, we announced the award of our new Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability, or JWCC, which will provide us with enterprise cloud computing from four world-class companies at all three security classification levels from the continental United States out to what we call the tactical edge, meaning an island in the Western Pacific, key terrain in Eastern Europe, or even a ship at sea. JWCC, which supersedes the single vendor, single award JEDI cloud procurement that we canceled in 2021, will enable the department to develop and deploy software in an agile, secure, and scalable manner while providing for data and compute and storage that will undergird efforts led by my CDIO colleague and others. Additionally, we continue to strengthen the department's cybersecurity posture, underscored by our zero trust strategy and implementation plan. The concept of zero trust involves protecting critical data and assumes that an enemy is already on our network and that we must verify the credentials of everyone and everything and that there be no unrestricted lateral movement across our enterprise. We plan to implement Zero Trust all across the department by 2027 and are working with the DOD components on their plans, ongoing actions, and investments to achieve this goal. Meanwhile, we're pursuing multiple lines of effort to strengthen the cybersecurity of the defense industrial base companies through outreach, provision of services, alignment of DOD activities, and preparation of the cyber Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification Program which will provide us with a mechanism to verify that companies are handling sensitive DOD data and are instituting required cybersecurity measures. We're also working with stakeholders in DOD to remediate the, quote, technical debt, unquote, that has accrued on many of our key weapon systems. While we didn't necessarily have to worry about terrorists and insurgents hacking into our jets, ships, or tanks over the last 20 years, we know that nation states will certainly try to do so. Ensuring our service members operate in cyber survivable equipment is a top priority for the department. In the same vein, we continue to strengthen our command, control, and communications capabilities. These include electromagnetic spectrum operations, for which we and CIO have taken over department-level oversight since this last year. Representing the nexus of electronic warfare and spectrum operations, our force's ability to dominate in this domain is critical to fighting and winning on any modern battlefield. All the while, we never forget our success comes down to people. We are releasing a new cyber workforce strategy and a related policy manual that will help us better identify, recruit, develop, and retain top-notch talent. Also, for the military and civilian members in DOD who have had to struggle for far too long with IT systems that are simply difficult or slow to use, we're doubling down on our efforts to improve user experience all across our enterprise. Using my office's budget certification authority, my team and I are driving strategies and will hold organizations accountable for continued progress. All of these activities rely on the strong support that this subcommittee has provided to DOD for many years. Thank you for this backing and for the chance to testify here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Dr. Martell is recognized for five minutes. Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Khanna, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. This is my first appearance before Congress, and I look forward to sharing the ongoing efforts of the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office. It's an honor for me to serve our nation as the first DOD CDAO. 
The importance of this role, the mission of the CDAO, and our service to the warfighter are not lost on me. From my experience as a professor of machine learning at the Naval Postgraduate School, to my time leading machine learning teams at some of the most innovative technology companies in the US, I'm proud to bring best practices and lessons learned to accelerate and scale data, analytics, and AI in support of the national security mission. The Deputy Secretary of Defense established the CDAO in February of last year, bringing together the authorities and resources of previously separate organizations, which included the DOD Chief Data Officer, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, the Defense Digital Service, and Advana, the Advancing Analytics Office. We recognize that data, analytics, and AI are core capabilities in supporting the Secretary of Defense's priorities to defend the nation, take care of our people, and succeed through teamwork. When I arrived in June, my team and I assessed the data, analytics, and AI capabilities and gaps at all levels of the department. We reviewed the recommendations from the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. We assessed existing digital technologies within the department, partner organizations, and the commercial sector. From these efforts, we've identified four key strategic elements. One, improving data quality. I'm going to say that over and over again today. Two, enabling advanced analytics and metrics. Three, providing the appropriate AI scaffolding. And finally, cultivating the key enablers for all of this. We refer to this as our hierarchy of needs. At the base of this hierarchy are the enablers, talent, culture, and leadership. These are the foundations of the work we do in CDAO. This includes fostering an educated workforce, leveraging the strengths of the commercial and academic centers, se sectors, and effectively integrating both our data and activities with our allies and partners. In addition, as a close partner to Honorable Sherman in the office of the CIO, um, they're delivering the storage, security, and computing infrastructure that this hierarchy depends upon. We work very tightly on this. Above these enablers, the next, labor is the next level is quality data. As our number one priority, quality data will enable decision advantage by powering the, both the analytics and the AI layers of this hierarchy. For example, data paired with powerful analytics dashboards will allow us to see what we own and where it is. Sounds simple, remarkably important. Similarly, complex AI models will bring enhanced capabilities both to warfighting and to running the business. These are not doable without quality data. Addressing these challenges via this hierarchy of needs will drive the department to being data-centric, to being the data-centric organization it needs to be. Now note, this hierarchy is a logical hierarchy. It doesn't mean we're not going to move forward on AI and getting things to the warfighter until data is perfect. We're going to be doing all of these things simultaneously. So based on this strategy, we are pursuing the following initiatives in 2023. One, creating the JADC2 data integration layer, which will enable combatant commands, as well as partner nations, to access, share, and in integrate data at all levels. Two, providing the enterprise with the appropriate AI scaffolding, which includes the services and infrastructure most needed to accelerate AI development and adoption across the DOD. Three, conducting a talent management pilot for establishing a defense digital core, a cadre of digital experts aligned to digital positions across the DOD and managed as a unified cohort. And finally, supporting our business performance metrics to ensure progress on the goals laid out in the DOD strategic management plan and the national defense strategy implementation plan. I look forward to working closely with the subcommittee on these issues and others as we enable DOD's current and future use of data analytics and AI for national security. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now proceed to question and answer. Uh, I will recognize myself for five minutes. Um, Dr. Martel, you sort of talked about the, I think, uh, or hinted at the tension in your job, which is there's all these things we need to do over the long term. We need to improve, just turn DOD into a data uh, centric organization. But in the short term, our warfighters, our joint warfighters, our combatant commands have needs. Um, uh, they have rising threats they have to confront. Um, at present, Joint All Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, textbook example of jargon, um, is increasingly siloed into individual service plans, which extends the timelines even more. Uh, as I understand it, the Deputy Secretary created your position primarily to help meet this urgent need, that is to rapidly deliver operational, data-centric, and truly joint warfighting capabilities to the COCOMs, especially Indo-Pacific Command. If this is your mission, and that's a mission I would support strongly, 
Can you just tell us clearly what CDAO is doing to deliver on it? You mentioned four things. Maybe is that what you would say? And if that is, what, what do you mean by scaffolding? Yeah, that's. Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman Gallagher. Um, the sorry, you're not in trouble. Okay, <laughs> did I do something wrong? <laughs> I, I think fundamental to the problem of the JATC <laughs> issue is that we think about it as a product or a destination or a particular capability. I don't think that's right at all. We, that's not how we look at it. JATC2 is simply a new way to do business. It's being able to get the right data at the right, the, at the right time to the right place so we can jointly exercise command and control across all domains from sensor to shooter. So you mentioned that the services are stovepiped, but I don't necessarily see that as a stovepipe. They've built systems that's, that work for their particular needs, and that's fine. We shouldn't want to stop that. We shouldn't want to dive deep into what they know how to do. But what we need to do is get the data from those systems to a command level so that, and have it flow easily to a command level so command, command decisions, strategic command decisions can be made and, and tasks down to shooters. So we see our job as developing this data integration layer. We can dive deeper into the, the geeky aspects of it, but uh, this data integration layer, which allows all of those systems to talk to it as a, as a, um, so that it can be shared where it needs to be, when it needs to be. If, um, so your, your office uh, now has substantial staff and resources. How what would be the fairest way for us to measure your success? Uh, what are the right metrics so that the next time you come and testify before us, we can sort of fairly assess you on how you're doing your job? Is it adoption of capabilities, speed of delivery? Is it the number of experiments? Is it the number of meetings, dollars spent? What would be the right metrics to judge your success? I, I hope it's not the number of meetings or dollars spent, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. I, I think it's very important to not have effort-based metrics. Um, we need outcome-based metrics. And so we think about, and, and to be clear, it's still unclear to me, that's a weird sentence, to be clear, it's unclear, but it's still unclear to me how we're gonna um, measure these things all the way down to the levels that we need to. But what we're driving for is time to usability. If someone needs a new capability and we've provided the underlying scaffolding, how quickly can that capability be fielded? Um, amount of data-driven decision-making, and we think about this sort of uh, uh, in a number of ways, but for an amount of data-driven decision-making per COCOM, per combatant command, mm. amount of data-driven decision-making um, per three-star forum. So we can actually measure these, these fora, and we can measure the number of dashboards being used, which is providing data to those fora. Um, and finally, um, uh, time to usability. How quickly, uh, so time to delivery is from a producer's perspective. We're gonna get it to you. How quickly can that then be used? So once it's delivered, if it just sits on the shelf, that's also not sufficient. It has to actually be used. So what sort of best practices and training do we have to wrap around that so that the warfighter can use it? Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Sherman, I may have to get to you in a, uh, a second round of question. Um, quickly, though, uh, Dr. Martell, can you just explain again, and in, in just for, for a liberal arts major, what do you mean by the scaffolding that you're talking about? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Chairman Gallagher. Um, most people think about AI as a product that's delivered. I think those products being delivered will be delivered best by our commercial sector, but there are things that the DOD needs to do around that product that's being delivered that we're not doing. For example, what the product should be doing, what a particular model should be doing, say, trying to detect something on the battlefield, we are the subject matter experts of that. We should be just saying, this is A, this is B, this is A, this is B, and getting that data labeled correctly should be our responsibility. Currently, we give that to industry as a responsibility, but I believe we should own that because that's our IP. Simultaneously, on the other side... My, that, my time has expired. I have to I hold myself to my own rules, so we'll have to come back. Otherwise, I'll be a total hypocrite. Uh, I just want to emphatically endorse what you said about meetings. Uh, to paraphrase Drucker, meetings are a concession to a deficient organization. One either meets or one works. One cannot do both, so we should not use that as a metric. Mr. Khan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the Oscar Wilde quote that the problem with socialism is too many damn meetings. But, uh, I uh, appreciate... Uh, I'm not the, sure if I'm supposed to respond to that. <laughs> I, I appreciate uh, your, your testimony. You know, we had uh, Dr. Eric Schmidt at my uh, oh, oversight hearing, and one of the points he made in the talent of, of cyber and tech is that 
Uh, he thought the DOD was doing a good job in recruiting, uh, a good job at the service academies, but the challenge was really the ability for people in technology to rise to meaningful positions. Obviously, you know, you don't have the multi-million dollar exits uh, in Silicon Valley, but the other thing that attracts people to these tech companies is their ability uh, not just to be grunt workers, not just to be mid-level folks, but to actually be in leadership and to be central in driving things. And as, uh, as, as jamming and AI uh, and so many of the theaters of modern war may involve technology, what is the pathway to get people up the ladder so they feel empowered, uh, both uh, Dr. Martell and then Mr. Sherman? Uh, thank you for that question, Ranking Member Conn. Um, I agree completely that we need to build pathways for uh, tech folks in the department. Um, but I think one of the benefits we have is that all of our workforce is in getting increasingly technical as our technology is getting increasingly easier to use. So one of the things we, we need to depend upon as a nation is we have to continue those pushes that, so that we generate practitioners, particularly in AI, it has been dominated by experts. And, uh, and I would say for the last 15 years, it's been dominated by experts. But there's a, a movement now where there's enough commoditized tools where skilled practitioners can actually deliver the value that experts used to be able to do. That's the tactic we're taking. How do we upskill the folks that are in the department now? And secondarily, how do we attract maybe not those people who already know walking out of school from a, top, from a select group of schools that they're going to get a Silicon Valley job? What about those folks who are not sure they're going to get a Silicon Valley job or a, a, a high paying job? That's still untapped talent in the United States. How do we create a pathway, an, uh, an extended apprenticeship so that then when they leave um, working for the DOD or working for the government, they're actually significantly better and more attractive to those industrial jobs? I don't think hire to retire is the right solution. I think transforming them is the right solution. I appreciate that, Dr. Bertel. But for Mr. Sherman, I would just say, though, that uh, you shouldn't aim just to have the top folks go to Silicon Valley and get the next layer. I mean, a lot of the top folks in Silicon Valley, like Vince Cerf, who's at Google, came out of DARPA, and it was really the Department of Defense that led so much of the innovation that came up with the mouse, that came up with drones, that came up with the Internet, that came up uh, GPS. Uh, with GPS. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the, the hope would be that the best and brightest would still want to come to defense, and it would be the inverse as opposed to... Uh, going to Silicon Valley. Thank you for that comment, uh, Representative Khanna. Um, I think that's right. I think they'll be more attractive if we have a robust workforce in place. So I actually see this as a means to that. Mr. Sherman. And Congressman, I would just add to this a couple points. Using every, every, excuse me, every arrow in our quiver that have been given to us by you all in Congress, things like cyber accepted service and other hiring authorities where we can pay folks a little bit more, get them in the door more quickly. And also think differently about how we manage folks' career and not the traditional 30-year come in the door and have the traditional step up the ladder there. Now, folks are never going to make the same amount of money in DOD. That's not what's going to bring them in here. It's going to be the mission, protecting us against the PRC, putting ISIS back on their heels, those kind of things. I saw this in the intelligence community as well. But we have to think differently about the credentials that folks need to come in, things like apprenticeships looking, you know, what are the degree requirements? Maybe a four-year degree is not required. Apprenticeships can be a way to go on this. And then very importantly, recognizing that folks are going to come in and out of the door here, and we have to partner with industry, and I talk a lot publicly about this. How are we going to do this where if someone comes to DOD, then goes to industry in Silicon Valley or Austin or North Carolina or wherever and comes back, how can we do this without having the security folks' hit explode where they have to go through another year and a half or two years getting in the door? We're going to have to figure this out. And to that point, sir, we have a new cyber workforce strategy that's actually coming out this week. One of the key pillars is exactly this point about creative approaches on how we get past the old think about how we manage tech careers on this, sir. All right, well, I'll look forward to working with you and the chairman on this. Mr. Gates is recognized for five minutes. Dr. Martell, it seems that for us to beat China at AI, the first thing we have to do is catch up to China in AI, right? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Congressman Gates. Um, I don't actually think we're behind China with respect to AI. I think that we're – but I, let, me, let me sharpen that. With respect to technological capabilities, we, we, we are, we are uh, as far ahead as any, anyone. With respect to talent, 
we are as far ahead, as far ahead as anyone, although I think there's a danger there. I think the fundamental difference is they are working, they are doubling down on, on high quality data and high quality compute. So we have high quality compute, but um, we need to double down on getting the data right. I think you need to start my clock, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, thanks for that extra time. Oh, darn it. Uh, so I, I, I rescind everything I just said, and we can yeah. start again. No, yeah, this it's, is all off the still, record. It's still on the record. Yeah. Uh, uh, but Mr. Gates gets it. Yeah, I'm no, I got it. I got you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so most of the analysis I've seen indicates that they're way ahead. So your testimony is interesting because um, it seems you do appreciate and understand that it runs cross-current to a lot of what we hear about China's current supremacy in AI, right? I do, uh, Congressman Gates, thank you. Okay. Um, I think we could have a more uh, interesting conversation in the closed session, I'm happy to do that. Okay, uh, so you talked about the data sets, and it, I'm really interested in the ways that China builds those data sets, where they get information. Does China have the capability to collect intelligence from the offshore oil rigs that they operate and own? Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman Gates. Um, I'd r rather tackle that in a closed session. Uh, well, I don't know. Sometimes I worry we overclassify these things. Like, shouldn't the American people know if there's oil rigs offshore that are, like, using Chinese data to collect information? So I, I think uh, probably a more, uh, more correct answer is um, my expertise doesn't extend to China to that, to that degree. Um, I think we're going to win any fight by providing quality data create the right scaffolding. Well, yeah, let me, ask another right place, let me ask another place where, um, where they may collect data. So does China collect data from the cranes that they sell to U.S. ports? Thank you for that question. Um, I, I'm not an expert on, on China's. Yeah, but I, I, I'm kind of concerned that, that, that an assessment of their AI capabilities is going to lash pretty closely to where they're getting these exquisite data sets, right? And so if they're, if they're able to utilize AI to aggregate this massive amount of data that they get from the cranes that they sell our ports, from the DJI drones that our law enforcement fly around, from the oil rigs that our U.S. oil companies sell to them, that that, that really is a, an important plug into AI, don't you think? Congressman Gates, I actually do. I think, I think it's a very important point, and I'm not trying to, to uh, dismiss it. Um, when I said I, I don't think they're further ahead with respect to AI, I don't think they're further ahead with respect to the algorithm capabilities or the, tech, or the talent capabilities. Um, uh, in fact, most algorithms are commoditized, and anybody has access to them at this point. Um, if, if, in fact, they are gathering data from more places, that will, in fact, produce Robust AI, uh, robust AI, and um, and if we need to gather, we, we can have a really robust conversation about what data we should be gathering. I'm very open to that, um, but I'm in agreement with you that getting the data right and getting the right data is what yeah, drives I'm, robust I, AI. I, I, I've spent all my time with you talking about how China gets their data, because I don't view our AI scenario as in a bubble. I think we're in direct competition with China. We win or they win. And if we don't know who's ahead, I do worry about getting to those deliverables in, in, in a way that we, uh, uh, we can measure them and fund them and, and advance them. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to have more fruitful discussion about um, how they collect data, how we can integrate that into our broader cyber strategy and our AS strategy. I look forward Mr. to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Case. Before I recognize Mr. Ryan, I want to recognize the Stump family from uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. They traveled all the way from America's district, the 8th District of Wisconsin, to listen to our witnesses and engage in this discussion about AI and technology. So it's very important. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ryan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome to uh, our guests from Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, thank you to you both gentlemen for, for being here today, for your service. Uh, especially Dr. Martel, stepping into a new role and position in any organization is always a challenge, and in the, the biggest bureaucracy in the world, uh, I'm sure. Uh, it's been a joy. It's been uh, not boring. So thank you for, for stepping up and, and, and both of your public service. I wanted to actually build on what Chairman Gallagher was, start, uh, was uh, getting uh, towards with you, Dr. Martel. You were starting to talk about kind of the roles and authority, not authorities, but the, the roles and responsibilities when it comes to 
within JADC2 specifically, um, kind of who builds what, you're talking about scaffolding, and you were beginning to say what you thought the role of commercial partners is. Could you expand on that? And, Absolutely. and to, to be specific and sort of where my – what I'd like to hear from you is how do we – and not a new problem, but how do we work better with and enable uh, particularly smaller and, and um, less known but I think often most talented companies to plug into the scaffolding that, that we're building? Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman Ryan. Um, one, of, one of the things that surprising, was surprising to me when I got here is, is how acquisitions work. You, you set out a bunch of requirements, and then five years later, a product is delivered, and the world has changed drastically in those five years. That's the sort of thing we're trying to tackle. We're trying to be able to be efficient, um, flexible, iterative, iterative, and experimental. So our goal is to get a data layer, which allows for data to flow from any point to any other point, and then apps can sit on top of that data layer. So a particular uh, combatant commander, a particular commander might want an app from one vendor, and another combatant commander or commander might want an app from another vendor. And um, we need to see that data layer as the, the underpinning a marketplace that allows any vendor to show up and say, I have a solution for this particular problem. I think that's... Um, a much more iterative way, an experimental way to get, at, to get at this as opposed to saying every commander you get the same thing. When the commander uh, out, out on the ground might need something very different than something in a maritime domain. And we need to uh, allow for that marketplace, both for the big players who produce real value and particularly in the AI space, three guys in a garage might actually change the game and we need to allow that to be available to them as well. I agree. My concern is time and urgency. I mean, we've heard many different timelines for potential major conflict, particularly with China, and none of, building a data integration layer um, against a bureaucracy that's not used to doing that. I mean, how do you, how quickly do you think we can build that? What can we do, as as you know, in our role as members of Congress, to enable that, to accelerate that? What authorities do you need? What resources do you need? Uh, thank you for that. Uh uh, for that offer, Congressman Ryan. Um, I'll take it as a question for the record for probably the end of the year to get back with you with more specifics. Right now, we're undergoing the guide experimentation series, which is global information dominance, where we're actually testing these things. We just, did, we just finished one. We're doing another one uh, next month, I believe, um, with a key partner being Indopaycom, and understanding how what we've learned, for example, uh, at UCOM, at European Command, might be applicable in a maritime domain like in Indopaycom. Like, uh, yeah. So um, we'll have, the point of those experiment, that experimentation is to come up with a capabilities gap analysis so we can actually answer those sorts of questions for you. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I'm running short on time, uh, uh, Mr. Sherman. On cyber talent management, could you just uh, continue to expand on that? Are there additional authorities? You talked about the cyber accepted service. Are there additional authorities or tools that would be helpful to, to advance that mission? Congressman, I think we have the tools at our disposal, like Cyber Accepted Service and Targeted Local Management Supplement, which is additional funding we can pro or pay we can provide to folks in, in certain areas. I think we just need to continue to use these authorities and continue, sir, to work with industry, you all in Congress and elsewhere, as we generate ideas about how to think creatively about a 21st century workforce, some of whom may come in for a long career, but others very likely are going to come in and out. And a matter of fact, we're going to want them to do that for careers like data scientists and others to not stay in government their whole time, but go to industry and come back and figure out how we can do this in an agile way to stay ahead of the PRC and others. I appreciate that. I, I'd encourage you, think creatively. If there are additional tools and authorities, I think you're hearing from us, we want to give them. So please come back and I yield back my one second. Uh, oh, great use of time. <laughs> Next up, uh, the son of Notre Dame, Dr. Mr. Fallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, when we talk about securing our networks, against our adversaries, our enemies, it's absolutely, you know, I think it's critical that we understand exactly what we're up against and where our vulnerabilities may exist. It, it doesn't do us much good to invest billions of dollars in security if there are entire swaths of our network that remain open and vulnerable, of course, to hostile actors. And as we <clears throat> talk to folks in the industry, I, I've come to learn that this was, in fact, our reality in the DOD information network in the not-so-distant past. Thankfully, we've had 
you know, we've taken the steps necessary to remedy the situation, and I believe it's essential that we continue to invest in technology and secures our networks by leveraging um, new advances in technology um, with our network through the eyes. We have to see our network through the eyes of the enemy and where they would perceive vulnerabilities. So, Mr. Sherman, how are you leveraging AI-backed technologies to discover and remediate vulnerabilities before our adversaries can exploit them? So in terms of AI-backed technologies, the main place we're going to apply that is what we call the big data platform, where we bring data together to assess what is going on on our networks. But, sir, if I could say, AI is just part of this. Mm -hmm. It really is, to your point in your question about what we know the other side's doing, is the partnership I have with General Nakasone at U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency to get threat-informed intelligence about what the other side, China, Russia, et cetera, are doing against our networks. And also, again, AI undergirds some of this, but it really is that zero-trust approach I noted in my opening statement, statement where we assume an enemy's already on our network. The burglar's already in the house. And how do you prevent them from moving laterally throughout the house? And using what's called identity credential access management, where it has to be verified, someone's identity along the way, to make sure that they can't move to get to your most critical data. So it's a new way of thinking about cybersecurity, not just at the perimeter or not even a defense in depth, but a whole new way of thinking about you don't trust anything or anyone. And that's what we're really doing to lock down our network, sir. Kind of assuming that the, maybe the submarine is b below the destroyer already, right? And you, you can't right. see him, but you might be there. Uh, Dr. Martell, how do you see AI developing as a component of the DOD's cyber mission? And uh, also, how can we remove barriers to entry for companies developing and deploying AI? Uh, thank you for those questions, uh, Congressman Fallon. Um, uh, I echo what uh, Mr. Honorable Sherman said, that um, – that it's mostly about data and it's mostly about zero trust. And let me, let me say that zero trust underlies, it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it, the, it's a binary relationship, it goes both ways, right? So we can't build what we build without the zero trust underpinnings that Mr. Sherman provides. But I also think AI can provide some help to security, particularly in anomaly detection. So once we know the flows and we can track the flows of people through the zero trust architecture, we can build systems that will help us detect whether it's a, um, an anomalous flow, something we might want to look at. We might want to uh, just sort of dive a little deeper there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Sherman, as far as recruiting talent, you know, we if people come into our office and it doesn't matter what industry they're in, they have labor shortage, they have labor need. And now we're not even uh, meeting our recruiting goals. I also sit on the armed services. Uh, 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 we, I'm sorry, I, I, we learned that last year in armed services that the Navy, the Air Force, the Army weren't hitting the recruiting goals. So where are you all with the labor? And you just mentioned about attracting that talent. How do you attract that talent? And uh, Because it is competitive, and, and they can make so much more on the outside. Sir, that is exactly what we've been getting after as well with this new cyber workforce strategy. We have something called the De Defense Cyber Workforce Framework. It sounds bureaucratic, but it's where we've taken all of the 70-plus work roles in cyber and digital and with a fine fine-tooth comb, and much more granularity than you would see from the Office of Personnel and Management on exactly the sort of work roles where we're going low or we're right where we need to be and we might need to uh, apply some new incentives kind of with the rear stat of adjusting where we're getting low on maybe cyber defenders or software coders or whatever. And this has been a key tool we've implemented. We've added AI and data work roles. And this has been enlightening for me as a CIO about the levels of specificity we have to have to make sure when you start to see a kind of a warning light, hey, we're getting low on this type of work role, we need to apply some cyber accepted service or other types of uh, market supplement we can put against this. It's been a lot of pick and shovel work, sir, but now we have a foundation to really look across a dashboard to see where we are, particularly with our civilian, but also working with our military workforce. So I would say we're making a good start on this. We've got the tools we need and applying the authorities you all have given us to, to address shortfalls. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Golden, great Marine is recognized. Semper Fi, man. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like a bad thing. Um, Dr. Martel, in your prepared remarks, you, you talked about uh, the cyber workforce framework and you were, uh, referred to a pilot uh, for Defense Digital Corps program. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to, obviously, the, the goal is to foster digital talent and everyone's 
we've had several rounds of questioning there. Uh, so the National Security Commission on AI previously uh, advised uh, that uh, perhaps there should be a digital reserve core, which I think would be a nice complement to what uh, you're talking about having a, a digital uh, core. So is that something that you've thought about? Uh, the, here in the House, the Four Country Caucus uh, has been pushing for that. We are a caucus of all vets. Tony Gonzalez uh, ha, has been the lead on that. Uh, we've gotten it through the House and previous NDAAs. It's always kind of suffered in the Senate. But uh, could could either one of you or both of you comment on, on whether or not that might be a way uh, to have a, uh, your cake and eat it too? I mean, uh, we just had a conversation about talent is going to the tech industry and the private sector. Why not try and get some of those folks to serve while they're also out there in the private sector? Uh, thanks for the question, Congressman Golden. Um, hallelujah. Uh, I think that would be amazing, particularly uh, because the Defense Digital Corps' goal is to see, to figure out what talents needed across the department and to be able to bring that talent in and seed it, but also manage it as a cohort because they're going to be onesies, twosies, and alone. And no one wants that job, right? And then, and but if they're a cohort and they can share, and they can share problems, they can share issues. Um, I, I, we can, we can much better manage and grow them, right? And give them real careers. If we can do that seeding by folks coming in for, depending on how this works, I, we can talk about this afterwards. I'd love to. But uh, even if it's you know uh, two weeks a year and a week and a month, um, but then periodically for a year at a time, uh, that would that would lend itself very nicely to the way we're thinking about it. Ditto on all he said, and I would add, too, I think we need to push ourselves to think creatively about how we do this. I mentioned security clearances, but not everyone needs a secret or top secret, and particularly with the explosion of uh, remote work, that how do we tap into talent where they don't have to all come move here to the Beltway? They can stay in Texas or Massachusetts or Washington State or wherever they are and tap into that talent. I definitely think that's something we ought to look at. And again, on that broader cyber strategy, our third uh, goal on there, is, it's worded more finely than this, but think creatively and, and come up with creative solutions. I think this would definitely fit on that that we would need to explore further. Well, I suspected that you both would think that was a good idea. So, of course, my audience is the committee itself and, and the Senate uh, committee. So uh, I think that's something that we should push once again and hopefully get through uh, in the next NDAA. Uh, with the time remaining, I want to ask uh, either one of you to field this question, uh, which is pretty simple. Uh, I think Pat here was, was on to onto something talking about the urgency and how quick can you move. What are you learning just looking at, at the battlefield in Ukraine right now about how you can adapt on the fly uh, to start to use data, to start to use apps, and uh, maybe even blend uh, you know, those uh, emerging technologies with, um, with the things that we already have in place right now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for that uh, follow-up, Congressman Golden. Um, we have lots of technology that we can bring to bear um, on solutions uh, and on problems, and we have lots of people willing to tackle those. The things that I've seen that have worked well is when we get that technology in the hands of a large group of people, well-trained, and they're able to stand up quickly and deliver real value. I'm happy to go into a deeper and a closed session. We better be secure. We better be agile, and we better move in a digital environment. They're fighting World War II tactics, but on a 21st century battlefield, and we better adapt. And we are taking lessons learned on this, and particularly how we would look at a China scenario. But I think those pillars, whether it's uh, satellite communications, cybersecurity, or as the ranking member noted, uh, electromagnetic spectrum operations, how we fight through spectrum and maneuver and survive there, all these lessons are going to be relevant, and, and speed matters. So that's what I'm taking away from this. Thank you. I'll, I'll yield back. Dr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the committee's been closely following uh, the perspective sharing of the 3.1 to 3.4 gigahertz spectrum. And uh, obviously with, with the amount of technology and communication that we're doing that's just parabolically expanding, uh, we have real concerns about giving that up to the commercial industry, which would just gobble it up instantly. And once you give it away, you can't bring it back. Who ultimately makes the decision on whether that's divested from or not? As it stands right now, per a 2000 NDAA, it would be the Secretary of Defense. 
basically making that decision. On proposed legislation that the administration currently backs, it would be the president in his or her role as commander in chief, but based on direct advice from the Secretary of Defense on that matter. Would there be any reason for the Secretary of Defense to ever consider giving up any bandwidth? Not giving it up, Congressman, but figuring out how we could share it. Sharing in terms of time, in terms of, ge in terms of geography, or in terms of radio frequency so we could con conduct our military training operations here in the U.S. and homeland defense, but also giving our economy an ability to stay ahead of the Chinese in areas like 5G. Hmm. With, with the amount of technology that continues to expand and the amount of people that keep on burdening the, the, the gigahertz uh, spectrum, if we start sharing it, though, are, are, how, I don't understand how we ever grab it back. And my concern is once we start sharing, it's, it's a bottomless pit. In other words, they'll never be satisfied with what they get, and they'll never want to give it back up. And the fact that we in the military, we get more and more advanced uh, needs – why would we, once again, why would we go there when there's, there's got to be another way? Well, absolutely, Congressman. We wouldn't want to vacate where we're shoved out and never to return again. Sharing would mean kind of joint ownership of this, where if we're conducting military operations near an installation, conducting homeland or border security, that we would have the military radars on and be able to operate, and that the telecom providers would potentially have to switch to another area. And we've got some examples we've done in past administrations working walk and chew gum. But the band you noted, sir, mm -hmm. this 3.1 to 3.45 mm -hmm. is beachfront property, both for long-range radars as well as telecom needs here. And to the chairman's point about competition and dominating against China. I have the CIO equities for DOD. I want our radars to work, be able to protect this homeland, keep our citizens safe. But I also know economic dominance matters too. So I'm committed. We have a study we're undertaking right now per the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act that Congress, you all tasked us to do, that culminates on 30 September. No decisions would be recommended to be made until we can do our due diligence and figure out if sharing is even possible. Sir. Okay, great. I'm, I'm from Camp Penland, so I'm used to that uh, people trying to gobble up uh, prime real estate there. Um, when it comes to the battlefield and some of the technologies, uh, I'm a firm believer that we have the best staff NCOs in the, in the whole world, and that's why we're working better under conditions where we don't have comms. Obviously, uh, top-heavy organizations like Russia and China don't have that luxury, nor do they have the same experiences, um, which brings to bear that our technologies and disrupting their communications become paramount, uh, as well as securing our own, because it's always, an, as an Anglico guy, I've always had uh, problems with disruption of, of, of uh, frequencies. He, he loves the Anglico. He loves Anglico. <laughs> um, uh, I guess my question is, do you feel like, and this I'm not asking any secret questions, do you feel like we're putting enough investment into that countercom and, and the comm uh, abilities in the military? And for, so what you're talking about, sir, electromagnetic spectrum operations. What we've done, we did in Vietnam, we had to do in Desert Storm, Bosnia, and elsewhere, but uh, to different degrees in Afghanistan and Iraq. But as we get ready for China, we better be able to fight and dominate in this space. So to your point, sir, I think investments, from what I've seen, are sufficient now, but this is something I'm going to bird dog very carefully from my office here, particularly as we see the services starting to kind of regenerate electronic warfare and other capabilities, both to put the enemy back on their heels and ensure our NCOs and our trigger pullers can stay in touch with one another. As we've seen on the Ukrainian battlefield, all the dynamics with MSO of how the Russians are trying to use it and the Ukrainians are using it, that we cannot be cut off on this to be able to make sure we can conduct combat operations. So your feeling is right now we're doing adequate, but we need a big investment for the future to continue this? I think we need to keep a close eye on it here and monitor as we regenerate this capability that we had in the Cold War, that we had to kind of maybe somewhat turn away from a bit during the War on Terror. As we regenerate it, I want to assure this committee I'm going to keep a close, close side on this as we move forward. I yield. Well, apologize for that. I got I got carried away with the gavel, L like like the ring of power. It ultimately corrupts. So uh, I recognize Mr. Luttrell. Keep it handy, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for being here in front of us today. You talk about data quality as one of your, as one of your pillars, and and I and I absolutely understand the importance of data quality. But uh, as we move forward here, aggregating the data is obviously what's most important because you talk about sensor to shooter. My question is, are we utilizing retrospective data or prospective data only? 
either one because as dirty as data is and we have to filter it, and as Mr. Golden said, we're trying to keep pace with China, but if we don't have the infrastructure in place, how are we going to clean that data to give that information back to the shooter, as you say? Thank you for that question, Congressman Luttrell. That's a, um, um, a, a, a can of worms in a, in a number of ways, right? So, so do we wait till the data is clean before we act? No. So we're going to have to act on dirty data until we, until we get it right. Um, um, one way we tackle this is to say no new bad. So we know that we have to deal with the, the past stuff, the, the systems and the data that have been built, that have been built in, in ways that are, are not up to snuff. Um, but we need to make sure that things going forward are, are doing things right. So part of the way we think about this is as we build up this infra, new things that we bring on board are doing data right. But we absolutely do have to go back and uh, recontract. As contracts come up, as, as we have to reacquire things, we have to, part of what we're going to deliver are the contracting vehicles that allow folks to specify this is what good data looks like and this is what getting, getting data looks like, uh, getting, getting it right. And the other thing I just want to add is um, distributed governance uh, and building CDO structures down through the components is extremely important to this. It, just it, seems, it, has, it has to be aligned with incentives. It seems like such a slow process c considering the silos that we all work in, especially in government. It's, ap it's absolutely a slow process, sir. Um, but so we have to be able to do that slow process and get it right while simultaneously um, still allowing for new folks to deliver value. I, that, that's, that's a balance that we're going to have to strike. There's not going to be a way to, to snap our fingers and just have it get it right fast. Sure. Um, and this is going to be a follow-up, but we, you and I are going to have to meet because this, this, this is it, it's sitting on a panel with a bunch of shooters right here. Um, who's setting the inclusion criteria for the data that's inbound? And do we have that infrastructure? Well, we're talking about exascale computing here. I mean, forget about petaflaps. If we're doing real-time maneuverability, it's got to be quick. It, it has to be that lightning fast. And it, it, given just the footprint of the American arsenal itself, does DOD have that infrastructure? I know DOE, as far as I know, has the fastest computer in the world, Summit, and I don't know if DOD is even anywhere close to that. Well, not for high, well, yes, we have high performance computers, but to your point, this is why that joint warfighting cloud capability, we had to stick the landing on this and we got it now. With four companies, in no particular order, Oracle, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft, all bringing their cloud computing capabilities, and sir, and I know you're familiar with this, out to that tactical edge, and that's where we're pressing, whether it's out on an island, inside the first island chain, or somewhere in Eastern Europe or Sub-Saharan Africa to be able to have with special operators or whoever, cloud computing capabilities, OCONUS as well, state of the art. And this is why JWCC, and as we move past that JEDI cloud procurement that had all the issues, that we have this now, and we're gonna have it at all three security classifications, up to top secret, which is gonna be a game changer on this. And that's why this has been so important, sir. Is there a beta test in in process progress right now or a scalable program that's in place that you can that we could see so in so, real time um what we could show you we have cloud capabilities already underway in the department I, the I'm, I'm talking all the way from where i can reach out to i can reach out to a operator on the ground saying this is what i I'm receiving this. I think we could show you that. And the other thing, sir, I'll tell you, we're building off what the intelligence community has pioneered. And I know you've likely seen some of this yourself, sir. So we are, we're not reinventing any wheels on this. We're riffing off what my IC counterparts have done. So, sir, we'll take that for the record, and we'd be happy to try to set up a demo or something on that for you, sir. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kiggins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our panelists for being here today as, as a liberal arts major also i've done some reading about spectrum and uh and the backbone of our communications network and using abundantly by the public and private sectors alike so the latest battleground over spectrum allocation involves the mid-band which is crucial not only for 5g and cellular data but also for dod missile defense air navigation space asset tracking and several other critical uses private spectrum for telecommunications use is vital for economic growth and global connectivity while the importance of federal spectrum allocated to DOD for national security purposes cannot be overstated. So given the competing interests between public and private sector spectrum needs, what proposed solutions does your office think are viable for band sharing going forward? And are there other lower spectrum bands being explored for DOD use? Ma'am, 
we're to the study we're conducting here on that 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz, that's beachfront property, I said, for the radars as well as the telecoms. We have a study underway, culminates on 30 September, that we've been leading since last year, sharing, not vacating, not where we get kicked out of it and where DOD has to go find some other spectrum, which would be very difficult. But how do we walk and chew gum and figure out, again, from geography, uh, time, and radio frequency use, how do we make all this orchestra work together with the telecoms in this highly congested but highly desirable space? Uh, we're examining this right now, and we would note that this is one of the most difficult parts of a band analysis we've ever done, just because it is so desirable, both for long-range radars to acquire missiles and so on, but also for 5G propagation. So we're studying this, but what I just talked about, those three principles of time, uh, geography, and radio frequency, are what we're thinking, if we're going to find a, a potential solution to this, that's how it's going to be done with the telecoms. And that's why I'm working so close with Commerce and NTIA and our interagency partners to make sure we look at the angles on this. But protecting this country is paramount in a consideration on this. Good. Thank you. And then I, uh, I have a couple bases in my district. I represent Virginia's second district, so Master Jet Base Oceana. Just listening to users over there, and I don't know if this is the the, the right venue to ask, but I just want to communicate some complaints of those guys when they got a lot going on, right? They're training to fly, they're flying jets over there, but they complain about the computers. And, and when you ask them what, are, what frustrates you about your job, what can we do better? It's the computers and it's the time to log on. And I don't know, it's the security portals that they have to go through. It's the Wi-Fi capabilities. It's the age of the equipment. So it's, it's for me, it's the little things. We talk about quality of life and recruitment and retention for our armed forces and and that's what they communicate. I mean, number one, it's infrastructure is a big one, but but I mean, computers is the second thing that they that they tell me. So I'm assuming this is your department. I mean, are those things that those little day to day things for those end users that they just show up and and they want to go home to their families at night too, and they they get frustrated and uh, and I want to do better for them. So so how can you help me do that? So we're going to lean in, and the term we use is called user experience, but really it's the fix our computers piece at what you're getting at. And I got to tell you, for my however much longer I'm in this job, this is going to this is a top priority here, and we already have some wind in our sails on this. As the budget comes out here shortly, uh, some investments we're making. It's a multifaceted problem. It is, yes, some new hardware. It is, yes, having uh, uh, cybersecurity scans that don't conflict with one another. Mm -hmm. It's having fiber on base down right. in Norfolk or where else. It's not having dated hardware like routers and switches right. and stuff that have been allowed to atrophy. Right. It's a multifaceted problem. And just yesterday, ma'am, I was talking to the Air Force's chief experience officer about how we do things like measure and not just go anecdotes, because I hear a lot, too, from the sailors and airmen and guardians and everybody else, but what can we do to really monitor the network to know when the spinny wheel is happening yeah. for the uh, the sergeant at Fort Eustis, and she's trying to get her maintenance report in? We, we're going to get after this because we're not going to fight with one hand tied behind our back, and it is a quality of life issue, ma'am, and I am dedicated to getting after this. Thank you so much. Please make yeah. that a priority, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Deluzio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Good afternoon. Good morning. Lost track of the time of day. Good morning. Mr. Sherman, uh, Dr. Martell, thanks for being here. Thanks uh, for your work and your team's work to protect uh, our information technology, cybersecurity, uh, our networks. I think folks often don't understand what goes into that good work, uh, so thank you. In our full committee hearing yesterday uh, with NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, Assistant Secretary for Homeland Defense and Hemispheric Affairs, one of the issues we touched on that I asked some questions about was uh, defense of our critical infrastructure. Uh, which I think is a place that obviously touches defense, but certainly Homeland Security and other, other parts of our you know, vital defenses here. Um, and we talked about you know, not just malicious actors in China and otherwise, um, but one of the, some of the challenges coming from the fact that much of our critical infrastructure is privately owned. It's not just under public control. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll start with you if you could talk about what those challenges are, what we can do better, what you know, this subcommittee and our committee should be thinking about. So the biggest thing is just what you said. We're going to take this seriously here. We need to work across the interagency as we work with 
Homeland Security, CISA, my friend Jen Easterly over there, I've worked with her for years, on how we work across all the industrial sectors. Now, for us at DOD, the defense industrial base piece, the defense critical infrastructure is where my line of sight is, but this is going to take a whole of government, whole of industry, and folks taking it seriously. And this is where we could con continue to use your assistance here on the subcommittee and the broader HASC, is making sure COs and others don't see this as a nice to have. We saw Colonial Pipeline two years ago and other places, that this isn't just a blinky lights, uh, uh, something that you can invest in if you want to. This this is critical. The, uh, an, an adverse actor can take down your entire, whether it's a pipeline, network. We've seen technical debt and things like with air traffic control and th things that have happened recently. We've got to take this very seriously. So Department of Defense, we're focused on the Department of Defense information network, but also our critical infrastructure. And one thing I have is budget certification authority, where I can hold services and others' feet to the fire to make sure they're having appropriate investments, and we need to do better on this, on areas like defense critical infrastructure to make sure we're protecting that piece of our enterprise as well, sir. Well, as a follow-up, you know, how, how would you, and for folks who aren't as dialed into what it is we're discussing, the work that goes into defense critical infrastructure, how do you compare where our defense industrial base is relative to other components of our critical infrastructure in this country? So I think that would be hard from my seat as the DOD CIO to do a holistic looking across energy, yep. automotive, and everything. I will know that, say that uh, in the defense side, we know that's where the Chinese, Russians, and others are trying to expropriate plans, blueprints, and everything else, and really trying to help uh, work with that industry to lock that down. I would just add, working with our interagency partners uh, on all the different areas, raising awareness of this. We have a new national cyber strategy. There's been other executive orders and so forth, working with you all here in Congress to raise awareness about this. And we've had some notable incidents, I think, that have been in the news that are raising uh, companies' awareness. So we have to keep up the press and not stop on that. And I'll ask maybe just one more follow-up. Is pieces of the way that we ensure cybersecurity and the defense industrial base do you think have application to other components of our critical infrastructure and other sectors? I think it absolutely does. As we uh, have standards that I know some may see as onerous, and we're working with industry to not make it onerous, but to make sure there's there's something we can all hold ourselves to account in implementing basic cybersecurity. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology, which I know sounds bureaucratic, has standards to be able to apply on basic things, on principles like two-factor authentication, end-to-end -end encryption and things that all companies ought to be able to looking at to do. And I grew up in South Texas and an area where we had a very small family company. I know how it is to have federal regulations land on somebody in Victoria, Texas, or elsewhere, but we've got to be thoughtful about whether it's a small company or a big one that everybody should take responsibility on this. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back, and I, I think I did use two acronyms, Northcom and Southcom. I, I apologize. It's going into your social credit score. Fair enough. Um, Mr. Lolota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, appreciate you being here, your leadership, your dedication, and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, I represent a suburban district east of uh, New York City, uh, 750,000 people in Suffolk County. We, Mr. Chairman, are America's district and uh, appreciate uh, the dialogue we have here today. Um, last September, the government of Suffolk County suffered a cyber attack. Uh, that shut down many of the government services that my constituents rely upon. Emergency dispatchers had to take down 911 calls by hand. Um, we had no access to the geolocating function that's typically uh, normal there. Police were forced to use finicky radio transmissions and call instances, uh, and that uh, no access to email reporting uh, from the field. Contractors were paid in paper checks. Uh, that created a huge backlog of services um, in the county at the county's traffic agency. People were unable to pay uh, pending tickets, which created extra fees and became a, a huge hassle in Suffolk County. Uh, in addition to the major shutdown of, uh, of government services, the hackers who claimed responsibility for the attack threatened to slowly leak sensitive information uh, that the government uh, had at hand. And unfortunately, the situations like this aren't unique to Suffolk County. We are constantly hearing about cyber attacks, data spillage, and ransomware and phishing throughout the country uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, and if hackers can have such an effect on my county, um, I fear that there could be a larger government entity, a state, or God forbid, our federal government be subject to a similar attack. Um, the office of the CIO, as I understand it, is responsible for the DOD IT enterprise uh, cybersecurity. I, too, am a liberal arts major, so I'm leaning a little bit into this as well. 
Um, and I do understand that you have protection over our uh, unclassified uh, and classified networks. Uh, so my question is this, um, to both of you, please, gentlemen. Uh, what is your office doing to gather lessons learned from these state and local attacks uh, to ensure that uh, their prevalence, their impact uh, is reduced prospectively? Sir, we work closely across the interagency. I mentioned DHS and CISA, for example, uh, in, in Department of Homeland Security to learn about and the very unfortunate attack against your district there, sir, and elsewhere, where we hear about attacks against schools, industries, and elsewhere, and what we call the targets, or excuse me, tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTPs is the government acronym on that, on how the adversary is, is using these, these mechanisms to employ ransomware or to hack into systems. I work very closely with the U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency, which is both under General Paul Nakasone. And from them, I not only get the, the cyber aspects, but also the threat-based intelligence of what state and non-state actors are doing and how they're operating and evolving. This is something I do every week and multiple days a week working with them to understand how we ought to be defending differently I mentioned earlier about a concept called zero trust, where we assume an enemy is already on our network. This is the state of the art on, we've talked about it for a while, but we're getting after it at the Department of Defense, on not just the old perimeter, defend at the castle and moat, and not even what we call defense in depth, but really preventing an adversary's ability to move across a network and hold data at risk as what happened in the attack you described, sir. So we must be a learning organization and stay very up with the threat-based intelligence on how an adversary is going to operate. Can you describe what your interactions are or will be with state and local governments to that end? I understand that you've properly explained the big picture on what the issue is and how it should be attacked, but uh, I fear that that information, that guidance, uh, isn't getting to the local officials where the rubber meets the road. Sir, my interaction would not be direct. It would be through the Department of Homeland Security who would interact with the state and locals there. And also, maybe obliquely, where we have, of course, U.S. military installations and garrisons that are relying on defense critical infrastructure power and so on coming onto those garrisons and bases and so on. But primarily through DHS is where that interaction and where I'm going to be hearing about what's happening in your district and also where if we're seeing something from a national security perspective, U.S. Cyber Command working with them could share that from a national security perspective. Thank you. And, uh, switching gears for a moment, uh, Congress required the Department of Defense to establish a comprehensive framework for the cybersecurity of the defense industrial base in Section 1648 right. of the uh, 2020 NDAA. Uh, their support was a full two years late. Um, and yet didn't seem to address a host of problems that still seem apparent about how the DOD uh, manages the defense industrial base cybersecurity. Um, did Section 1648 force any lasting change to how uh, the department manages its support to the defense industrial base? It absolutely motivated it, and we've got to keep doing better on this front. As we conduct outreach to the defense industrial base, as we organize ourselves internally, there's over a dozen DOD entities, large offices, that are touching this sector here to make sure we're organizing properly and not double double uh, communicating or sending conflicting messages, and also offering services as to the defense industrial base. For example, the National Security Agency's Cybersecurity Collaboration Center works, has uh, uh, service. Your, your time has expired. However, I was going to ask that question in the second round. So why don't we plant a flag there, plant and we'll come back to it. Roger. Sorry. We'll be right at audible. Sir. I'm a rule follower. I'm a Catholic Marine, so I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Keating's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had one uh, strain of questioning. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, I noticed, uh, Dr. Martell, your background on the private side. Uh, I noticed uh, the experience, you know, as head of machine learning for Lyft and uh, head of machine intelligence for Dropbox, as well as leading several IE teams uh, initiatives at, at LinkedIn. And I also know the challenges we have with workforce uh, and, and getting uh, trained, educated people throughout our workforce. So I was wondering, Given that background that you had, uh, what plans you might have to leverage uh, from those experience and to expand knowledge and skill sets uh, and in AI across the Department of Defense as a whole? Uh, can we do those kind of things internally uh, as well, and can we expand what we have? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Congressman Keating. Uh, I was born in Massachusetts, by the way. Well, and we'll we won't back. hold that against you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's a tough year for the Red Sox this year, so I think, perhaps. But, uh, go Bo Sox. Um, <laughs> So I think, I think we have to get at two things here. Uh, uh, 
if you look at what, AI, what, what talent used to be needed for AI, it was PhD level expertise. As the tools become commoditized, and as just education, even, even JPME, for example, professional military education, sorry, sir, professional military education, um, uh, is starting to add more data, more AI, more, more uh, IT literacy, the, the need for that expertise is going down. So I think there's two ways we can tackle this. One is we need to upskill folks we already have. Uh, we've already built out uh, 10 new work roles that are specific to AI with uh, Honorable Sherman's org. Um, uh, that are specific to AI and data. And my team has, um, is beginning to do analyses across the department about which components need which work roles. Secondarily, I think we, can, uh, we need to work with the services and the civilian orgs to be able to give actual careers to folks who want to do those sorts of work roles. Currently, it's the case that you, you, if you're in the service, you might do a data work role for, for one tour, and then you move on to something else, and you're doing something completely different. And in addition, your promotion is not based upon being successful in the data aspects. Your promotion is based upon, for example, if you're an unrestricted line officer um, uh, on, on your leadership. So we need to actually think hard about how we can have the careers and the motivations in those careers drive expertise in, in data, AI, et cetera. Simultaneously, I think we really need to tackle some untapped aspects of our workforce uh, in the US. If, if you went to a select school, you're going to have people pounding down your door to give you a very expensive job offer. I think that's great. And if we can um, um, motivate those folks to come into the service, uh, to come into government, that's wonderful. But there's a number of folks who might be just below that level or just a little bit below that where we can serve as an apprenticeship that transforms their capabilities. And so we might take a hit on the, on the front side where we're having to do extra work to bring them up to speed. But at the end, we have folks who are highly capable. And my view is we actually want to encourage those highly capable folks to go out to industry because that motiva motivates people to come in the other side of the pipeline. Now, they might stay forever. That would be awesome. But if, if we're seen as the one that ones that, that take you from not being able to get that amazing job, come work with us, and then you get that amazing job, I'm very happy with that. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. It, it really uh, echoes uh, what I learned uh, way back in uh, my MBA days in, in Massachusetts College, BC. So uh, I, I really am pleased that, that you're going in that direction. Thank you so much, and I yield back. On to a second round. I want to pick up where we left off with Mr. Lelota's question. Um, he mentioned that the Section 1648 report was two years late. Uh, additionally, um, DIB cybersecurity is your responsibility, correct? I'm tracking, however, at least six separate offices within OSD who have asserted leadership uh, some sort of leadership role in protecting the defense, di I, I did an acronym, defense industrial base, not DIP, defense industrial base um, to outside organizations and entities. So two questions. One is Mr. Lelota's question. What did the report force change? And then two, what are you doing in your role to bring coherence to an effort that from my vantage point looks somewhat scattershot at present? So to uh, uh, riff off that earlier question, yes, it has driven change, Congressman. Absolutely it has. On to the how are we organizing ourselves for victory here. So when I got this last year, looking, polling around DOD, how many organizations are touching a defense industrial base company, whether it's a small or medium or one of the big primes? And it's more. It's 12 to 13, depending upon how we count it. And I first held a meeting and brought all them in a room, Defense Contract Management Agency, Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, DOD Policy. I can go down a list. But putting myself in the shoes and talking to a lot of companies, how does this feel when you've got different entities either providing helpfully or trying to be helpful providing information or coming to you with the requirement? So what we've done, my acting deputy, who's also the chief information security officer, has stood up a monthly cadence with these organizations to get ourselves aligned on the DIB Management Council here. I think we call it something a little bit different. But bringing these organizations, who's sharing what? Who's talking to whom? Let's get aligned here and, again, put ourselves in the shoes of the affected companies. So maybe it could be helpful. It could be threat-based intelligence that maybe the National Security Agency is providing through that collaboration center I mentioned or another entity. And they need to be cross-talking. So if they hand something to one company, they say, also, we've got this from another DOD organization. So that's what we're doing, sir, trying to align this and make it a little more sensible and less bureaucratic. But you, 
consider yourself the leader of that council. Yes, sir. Of the six different offices that actually are, twelve. Yes, twelve. Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> twelve different offices. Um, okay, Mr. Uh, Dr. Martel, excuse me. Before JADC two, we had the joint information environment. Before the joint information environment, we had the uh, 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 global information grid. Have you reviewed those past efforts to understand why they failed and what you might do differently so that JADC2 does not suffer the same fate? Thank you for that question, Chairman Gallagher. Um, when I, I, I've been in the office now eight months, and um, I, I've tried very hard to ignore history. And the reason I have is um, as I started going down that rabbit hole, I felt myself being inculcated with the old ways of doing things. So I've asked myself, what's the right solution? Um, and, and we're now just turning to making sure that this right solution uh, maps correctly to our goals. So uh, look, I think the right solution is building out a marketplace that allows multiple vendors to bring apps to bear, where these older solutions were, uh, and I'm gonna defer a lot to Honorable Sherman because I believe these were under his purview, but um, they were older, these older solutions had rigid requirements that were established a uh, long time before delivery, and by the time the delivery came, the world has changed. We need to create a marketplace and infrastructure that allows for that, that dynamic change, and that's how we're tackling JATSI, too. Um, Mr. Sherman, uh, in what little time I have left, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to, to hear that we're moving out on a multi-cloud expeditiously. However, it seems we just lost the last two and a half years. Um, what lessons should we derive from that? Sir, do you mean in terms of the acquisition or what did we learn in the two years? Well, both. What? So what this we is one area here that, uh, that, yes, as a U.S. government, it shouldn't take us this many years to get enterprise cloud for the Department of Defense. And we mention about the, the CCP and if uh, G on that side says something, I, I, he needs something that quickly, he'll have it very quickly. We have to do better as a whole of government here in being able to procure and acquire services for the Department of Defense. This is an area we did get through. There's no protests. It's ready to go. But this is something that, frankly, sir, we should have been able to do more quickly and uh, without all the bureaucratic and other issues that came up. Now, on the the functional piece, the upshot here, we have what we've learned on the intelligence side with their multi-cloud, multi-vendor approach, and then also within the military services, uh, their own cloud efforts. You hear terms like cloud one and others, that's the Air Force effort. We have a lot of lessons learned we're integrating into this enterprise cloud effort. So we, we're, we're, we're not at a standstill. We have a running start from what we did there, sir. Um, my time is about to expire. Mr. Kana, uh, Mr. Keating. Mr. Luttrell, you have any more questions? You guys got off easy today. Um, well, with that, uh, I, I just would emphasize um, a couple points as we close. One, I think you saw a lot of interest in, uh, in sort of general talent management and whether we are adequately using the authorities that Congress has given you, particularly cyber accepted service authorities. I know we talked about that earlier this week, Mr. Sherman. So. I'd like to develop some sort of routine process whereby you can come and tell us, here's how these authorities are being used, here's what we're learning, and here's you know where we may need, we could expand it, or maybe we can't expand it. So I just would hope you would commit to that going forward. Um, and then Dr. Martell, uh, we, we had a little bit of a discussion about metrics. I just would encourage you to think through and, and would welcome a follow-up discussion on what is achievable. I recognize that you know the Pentagon's a massive aircraft carrier, it doesn't turn on a dime, but what is achievable in the next two years? What can we really deliver to our warfighters within the next two years? And so I'd be eager to work with you on what are fair metrics in both of those areas uh, going forward. Uh, and with that, the hearing is adjourned. Oh, we're going to move into a closed section. Closed briefing. And now the hearing is adjourned. There we go. Good thing I didn't hit the gavel.